Good morning, everybody. Let's get started, even without uh, the camera hooked on the computer. Um, well, today would be uh, probably one part that you're very much interested in, because today we will talk about silk processing. Um, main focus is on how to make fibers out of silk proteins. And, uh, but I also will show you some other processing um, abilities that, that we learned um, how to, to deal with uh, silk proteins. So we are right here. Um, what I will talk about today is a little bit about making fibrils and hydrogels, uh, which are, of course, of importance for biomedical approaches as well as cosmetic approaches. Um, then main topic will be fibers, also non-wovens, um, and then I will end up with um, some um, processing tools for films and capsules, and with the capsules I will restart then tomorrow when I talk about drug delivery. Um, so this, this was like the final uh, slide yesterday. Um, I showed you how to deal with silk genes to make molecular biology with, with the silk um, genes to produce proteins then in a bacteria. We talked about purification, and today's question will be the processing. So that's like the big thing. How can we use silk proteins? And here you see freeze-dried silk proteins. So they're white powder, and um, it looks like starch. How can this be transformed into a fiber? And of course, the key question first is how does a spider does that? And this is sort of, I, I have it here on the board already, but, but this is a more nicely drawn cartoon, um, how actually silk processing um, occurs in spiders. So this is one of the glands. Um, it could be, for instance, a major ampullate gland. And we have here um, surrounding this gland epithelia cells. And these epithelia cells, they produce the silk proteins. And the silk proteins are secreted. Um, and form then here the silk dope with very high protein concentrations, can be up to 50% weight per volume. Um, so this is an aqueous solution um, containing the silk proteins with structure in the terminal regions, but no structure in the huge repetitive core, as I told you. Um, and this is a stable solution. It can have properties of liquid crystals, um, but still, it's a solution, and it's completely reversible. So if you lower the concentration of proteins here, it's just um, looks like water. So the demand for the spider now is to actually convert the structure, unfolded repetitive structure in, in the core, into um, the better sheet-rich structure that we find in the fibers. And literally, this is what's going on here. We have a, like a two-part um, processing. We have a chemical processing, so to say, and we have a mechanical processing. And everything is accompanied by the removal of water. And by what I told you the last two days, I think this is now clear, um, that this is the most important part to remove the water, because silk proteins, at least the core repeat unit, is highly soluble in water. Um, and therefore, it does not make any structure. In order to induce structure formation, you have to remove water by whatever means. Spiders use epithelial cells to pump off the water, but this would be not enough. You just cannot just take out the water. How, how, how should that happen? So you need some chemical means to actually, um, what, what you have to do to, um, get rid of the water, you have to actually add something that competes with water for binding to the silk protein surface. And um, it is well known since more than 100 years, this was for the first time um, detected by a guy named Hofmeister, that salts can do that. So salts actually can compete with water for binding to a surface. Um, and salts that do that you call out salt, uh, out salting um, salts um, like phosphate um, or sulfate and so on. So phosphate, which is a natural occurring salt, can actually compete with water for binding to a silk surface. Um, and this is exactly the opposite that, um, or the opposite um, direction that um, you have with cryotropic substances, as, as I've shown here. 
like the guanidinium, that, that's an insulting salt, which solubilizes um, structures. The outsalting salts, like phosphate, they actually induce structure formation by removing the water from a surface. And this is what the spider does. Um, it pumps in phosphate ions into that highly um, concentrated protein um, solution. Then it acidifies, and we heard about um, the results of that. This acidification is necessary to convert the structure in the termini. Um, it rem removes some chloride, and then, of course, it removes the water. Um, and then that, that's the end of part one. And in combination with this chemical part, you need also a mechanical part. If you have noticed a spider, but also insects like a silkworm, they always draw on a silk fiber. Um, and this drawing on the fiber causes some shear stress, some laminar flow here in the final part of the S-shaped spinning duct. Um, so right here at the spinning ward, actually, we have quite a high shear stress. And this shear stress is responsible for aligning the molecules in order to get them correctly folded into the uh, fiber structure. And the combination of this salting out and this laminar flow is um, necessary in order to really get silk fibers with good mechanical properties. I will show you some experiments on that later. But to begin with, I would like to show you what happens if you add potassium phosphate to silk proteins. So if you take our recombinantly produced silk proteins and add um, a low concentration of potassium phosphate, low I mean below 50 millimolar, nothing happens. They're just stable in solution because these are salt concentrations that are not sufficient to cause salting out. If we then slowly increase the potassium phosphate concentration, like let's say up to 300 millimolar, we do see some structure formation, but this structure formation is very slow, and this is based on self-assembly. So maybe it's hard to see, but what we form here are uh, what we call nanofibrils. These are tiny little fibrils with a diameter of two to three nanometers and a length of several hundred nanometers. So we have a very high aspect ratio, and um, these nanofibrils have a very high content of beta sheet structure, and they are quite similar to what you see in amyloids. So these are amyloid-like structures, but the processing or the self-assembling process is so slow that this cannot be um, productive for making fibers. You have to imagine a fi uh, once a spider needs a, fi a fiber, it has to immediately convert the solution into the fiber. This takes hours. So this is not a productive, um, a productive route towards making fibers. We need a quick process, and we see that there are qu quick processes. If we just increase the potassium phosphate concentrations a bit more, and you see here sort of a transition zone, this means that at 300 millimolar potassium phosphate, we have 100% nanofibrils, and if we go to 400 millimolar, we have 0% nanofibrils, but what we get is particles. And these particles, they form very rapidly. They form within like two to three seconds. So this is an instantaneous outsalting process, which is driven by what we call phase separation. And concomitantly, structure forms. And the structure in these particles is identical to the structure that we find in fibers, in silk fibers, in native silk fibers. So this actually um, indicated that um, do have a fast salting out process, which leads to the formation of these particles. Um, and I will come to this in a little bit later, um, explaining why this is en route towards making a fiber. But I still want to step back and, and talk a little bit about, uh, uh, about these nanofibrils. Although this is not um, a natural process towards a silk fiber, stuff that we're interested in, you can make use of these nanofibrils for several applications. Um, so we analyzed this um, uh, phase separation process in much more detail. I don't want to 
talk too much about that. So there's two different ways how um, the mechanism works. We've published that um, already. Um, so the, 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 the roots are dif different. Um, and um, also the kinetics. So making particles is fast, takes just a few seconds. Making fibrils is slow because there's nucleus formation, uh, which takes a while. And then actually f starting from that nucleus, the fibrils start to grow until you have the final morphology. And the particles, they just outsort it. Um, and this is a fast, fast thing. So talking about these nanofibrils, um, they're quite interesting because if you um, increase the concentration, what happens is that these nanofibrils, they form what we call hydrogels. And you know hydrogels from daily uses in, in creams, in soaps, in whatsoever. Um, Hydrogels have a high potential also for biomedical applications. If you think about wound closure devices, sometimes you can um, already get hydrogels that you just bring like a paste into, into the wound and it's closing the wound quite rapidly. Because you can also incorporate um, drugs and other stuff in, into such um, hydrogels. Um, therefore, we really have um, or we see a high potential in using these hydrogels for applications. As you can see, the mechanics um, of these hydrogels are not uh, very high. So if you just have a physical linkage, just by um, um, a high enough concentration, you can easily, um, easily um, well, break up these physical bonds. Um, you have a very good strain, but the stress behavior, the maximal stress is not very high. So in, in order to increase the stiffness um, and the strength, of such a hydrogel, what you can do is to chemically cross-link um, the protein chains. And this will have a dramatic effect on the mechanical properties. As I told you, the possib uh, possible applications would be in cosmetics, but also in wound closure devices. And these are now roots, and this has been published last year. Um, roots, how to make hydrogels in a um, reproducible manner. And, and you see here very different possibilities how to do that. Um, and actually, um, it's very critical to find the correct route because many people try to make hydrogels, but most of these um, processes are not reproducible. So you need something where you really reproducibly can make a hydrogel with properties that you wish to have in the end. So we tried different routes. We start with uh, lyophilized protein. So this is one of our recombinant proteins. It's based on um, the um, Araneus diadematus fibrin number four. And the E says it's the engineered form, which we rec uh, recombinantly produced. And this is just one, one of the numbers, because we have several of them. So they come in a powder. Um, the powder is structured. So we have to remove the structure uh, with Gonidinium thiocyanate, so a strong chemical denatrant. Um, and then actually we have to remove the guanidinium by dialysis against Tris buffer. And here we have two different um, possibilities. Either we do the di dialysis at high protein concentrations, meaning above 1% weight per volume, or we do the, concentration, the dialysis at lower concentrations below 1% weight per volume. So the drawback with working with high concentrations is that um, during this dialysis, we already get um, chelation, meaning we do not have um, a good control on um, the hydrogel formation because it occurs here, especially above um, concentrations of 3% weight per volume. Um, and then we have a hydrogel, and we can add some crosslinker. The crosslinker is diffusing into on the hydrogel. It's a chemical crosslinker in this case, which can be induced by light. So we just shine light um, on the whole samples, and then we have a, a crosslinked hydrogel. At uh, um, concentrations between 1 and 3% weight per volume, while well, we do have some type of control, um, because it's not chelating here in, inside the dialysis tube, but um, we have to stay or to, to yet to stay with the concentration that comes out of the dialysis tube. We cannot play around much more um, once we do the chelation. We can either cross-link it or not. This is optional by just mixing it in. But we cannot um, adjust the protein concentration in the hydrogel very much. So this is not 
uh, what we call not, rep uh, not reproducible pathway. So therefore, we decided to go the other way, um, work with low protein concentrations, below 1% weight per volume. Um, then we get low concentrations also in TRIS buffer. Um, and then, of course, we have to up-concentrate that. We tried two different procedures using filters. And you see here, this didn't work at all because the proteins chelated in the filter and we couldn't get them out. Or um, doing a dialysis against polyethylene glycol, which is known, like in the spider, to remove water from the system because the polyethylene glycol um, is very hygroscopic, so it's uptaking water. And you can remove the water, and therefore you're up-concentrating your protein concentration. And you can do that in a controllable manner, because we can nicely control the protein concentration just by the length of the dialysis against polyethylene glycol. And then, if we have uh, a certain um, concentration of protein, we can add the crosslinker by mixing, and then we get either non-crosslinked or crosslinked hydrogels. So you always see that the uh, crosslinked hydrogels are yellow. This is coming from the slight induced crosslinker, so you easily can tell if uh, a gel is crosslinked or not just by gaining this yellow, yellowish color. So we analyzed them at different concentrations, 3%, 5%, 7%, for instance, um, and of course they do have different um, mechanical properties, although depending, um, also depending on the crosslinking, not crosslinked or not crosslinked, and also they do have different pore sizes, and we're currently investigating um, these hydrogels, especially uh, for the use as, as scaffolds in tissue engineering. Um, so therefore the pore sizes have to be large enough to have sufficient um, nutri nutrition, um, giving nutrition to the, to the, uh, to the, to the cells. But um, so far, it's very preliminary. Um, I can't give you more details on that. But um, there are at least some interesting material uh, because of the mechanical properties. And uh, we'll talk about that in the Friday lecture when I talk about um, tissue engineering again. So as you can see, this is a non-natural processing um, leading to these hydrogels, but th this is already one of the applications, and, and this makes now the silk protein so fascinating. I mean, we always think about the fibers as the final root and the final product that we want to work with, but the proteins have a much higher potential. We can use self-assembly, for instance, to make these hydrogels. They have nothing to do with the natural process with the natural behavior of the molecules, but still we have then some properties that might be fruitful for tissue engineering, for instance, but also for other properties. So here you see that we really understand um, this setup now in much more detail. We also um, included fluorescent markers like fluorescein in this case, where we can follow now the assembly much closer, so the blue um, um, bars here mean there is a chemical crosslinking occurring so in non-crosslinked shells, we have a bulk network with low mechanical stability. Uh, by um, introducing the chemical crosslinking, we get a much more compact nanofibrillar um, network with increased mechanical stability. If we have the fluorescent markers in there, so the fluorescent markers typically are hydrophobic, we still have them but like a spacer in between the individual strains. And this is important because here we can actually control now the pore sizes very precisely in the hydrogel. And if we actually do not add the um, fluorescent markers, so if we remove these hydrophobic mo moieties, then actually we get a very densely packed nanofibrillar network um, showing the highest mechanical stability but the smallest pore sizes. Um, and this also allows us now, I mean, we just don't have to use fluorescent markers. We can use any kind of hydrophobic moiety um, to actually control now the pore sizes. And this allows us now to really adjust, well, A, the mechanics, and B, the pore sizes. And this is very important um, in terms of um, applications because now we really have a very precise control. And, and of course, we can adjust the protein concentration, which is also um, greatly influencing mechanics and pore size. So we have a very good control over the process, and we really can work with standard operating procedures, SOP. Um, this is what you typically use in industry. Um, so whoever does that uh, procedure, that protocol, gets the same result. And this is very important. We 
tested that even with students. So if they follow the protocol, then they always gain the same properties depending on the route that we're working on. And this is one of the major issues I have in my lab that we actually establish protocols that are reproducible. And no matter um, if there's an engineering student or a chemical student or a biologist, if they follow the protocol correctly, they should end up with the same result. And this is really important. Um, if this is not the case, then the protocol is not good. Uh, so we throw it away and try to find a new protocol. So for, for making hydrogels, we have no such a protocol established, but again, back to the fibers, um, because this is like the most pressing issue. How can we make um, fibers out of a solution? Um, and as I told you, as a first step, we just added phosphate to the solution and we get spheres. Um, and in order to find out now how actually that happens, we um, designed a, um, a device that is based on microfluidics. So actually what you do is to make something that you have in mind for engineering just at a very small scale. And we actually made different units that we could put together. So we have a device where we can mix different um, solutions, like the silk solution, the phosphate, or also we can change the pH in here. Then we have a device which has a conical shape. And this conical shape allows us now to um, put shear stress and laminar flow onto the solution just by narrowing here the channel, actually we will provide shear stress on the samples. Um, then we have here um, a mo mo model that um, allows us uh, to analyze the stuff right there because we can put a camera on top or a, spe a spectrometer or whatsoever. And then we have a device here where we can combine the laminar mixing and the elongation of flow in just one setup. So this was sort of the idea to find out now what's going on. How can we make fibers out of our proteins? And if we just do the laminar mixing, as I showed you before in the test tube, the same thing happens in um, the microfluidic device. If we just do the mixing, we get spheres. That's just a simple phase separation process, the salting out. And um, this even um, occurs if we do the laminar mixing and um, provide then later on the shear stress. The reason is that structure formation here is so fast, less than a second, that um, the spheres are formed already here. And if you then um, apply shear stress onto the spheres, nothing happens. This is a finalized structure. So the idea was that we have to do both at the same time. Salt out the molecules and apply shear stress simultaneously. So therefore, we had this fourth um, motive here, the fourth mo module, where we could mix and simultaneously um, add shear stress and then analyze it. And this is what happened. I mean, we still got particles, but they sort of like already, well, come together. It looks like um, um, balls on a string. So this was the first indication that if we do that, we, are, we might be fast enough to align the molecules um, with this elongation of flow. However, you might agree, th these are still not fibers. And the point there was that we forgot to change the pH to begin with. And I told um, about that in the, in the um, first lecture, that um, we do have the pH dependence of these salt bridges down here. And we have a movement of the um, C terminal domain upon, sorry, upon um, pH changes. So this, this actually, um, brought us to the idea, and you see in the spider that we do have an acidification um, ongoing in the spinning duct. So this, the pH drops from around 7.2 to 6.4. And this is sufficient to do that um, conformational um, conversion. I talked about that in detail. Um, and also, it induces dimerization of the end terminus. So I also talked about that in detail. Here is, again, the slide from the first lecture that we could form these anti-parallel dimers in the amino terminus. Um, this allows now to make fibers. So um, if we apply that now in our micro microfluidic device, it really works out very well. We can make fibers, but only if we lower the pH simultaneously with increasing the phosphate concentration and providing um, the laminar flow. We even can um, add phosphate right before 
um, lowering the age and the elongation of flow. But this really has to be in a very short sequential order. And this only works if the phosphate concentration is not too high. If we use too much of salt, um, then actually this is a much too fast process. So we can, that's, um, that's the take home message here, control by the concentration of the phosphate the salting out process. As you've seen also in the beginning with the nanofibrils and the spheres. So um, there is some um, control on that process. We just don't have to put everything together. We have a slight control, but um, it's very delicate um, balance between the concentrations of the salt and the, the time frame, the, the order of appearance of these, um, of these effects. But as you can see, then it works out. We can make fibers, diameters, three, four micrometers. So this is pretty much what we see in nature. Um, and they can, made, can be made endlessly. Um, so we're working further on these microfluidic devices and try to improve the setups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is very nice for playing around in the laboratory, getting ideas about um, how the fibers form. And you see here some polarized light images, seeing some structures in here. Um, so this is what we continue to work on, but for a large scale up um, for fiber um, production, this is not useful. I mean, this is good for understanding all the molecular processes, but not for making fibers. For making fibers, we actually thought about a biomimetical approach where we wanted to transfer now all the knowledge that we got from the microfluidics to a bigger setup. So, and this is sort of the scheme of the setup. So we have solubilized protein to begin with, and we pump it in a diffusion unit that can do as well ion, ion exchange as water removal. This hap happens here in the diffusion unit. And then we have a motor that pulls out the fiber uh, with a defined reeling speed. Here you have this drum. We pull out the fiber. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but here's the silk fiber. Here's a, a scanning electron micrograph. And you see we have dimensions roughly between 3 and 4 microns. So again, dimensions as we find in nature. So this is quite intriguing. So we can actually make, with such a technical setup, fibers. But still, that setup was sort of um, uh, handmade still and um, was uh, not producing endless fibers. So we were thinking about getting that more robust. And this is the setup that we're currently using in the lab. Um, so this is just a CAD drawing. I'll show you also an image later on. Um, which combines now here um, a robot that allows us to mix different kind of, um, of solutions automatically instead of having like the microfluidic device where we pump it in um, by hand here. Everything is done by a robot. Uh, we can have like def uh, several uh, spinning devices in parallel. So the robot feeds um, through a pumping system like here. So the robot just makes the solutions here and he feeds um, actually, the diffusion units, which would be down there. Um, and then there's space for, well, different um, ad additives and, you know, gimmicks that we can also introduce. But literally, the fiber will come out down here. And it's running then here over these wheels. And these wheels are um, a sophisticated mechanical setup where we can actually online measure the mechanical properties um, of the fibers. And they're all hooked up to a computer. Um, and uh, here is the real thing. You see here the computer is hooked up. Um, the computer is controlling um, the, the pipetting robot, also like the different um, spinning devices in here. And is also linked to the mechanical device down there. Um, and uh, so we can now give actually filters that um, will tell us when or at which mixture um, of the robot, we get um, a fiber that, that we want to have mechanically. And we can go back um, and adjust then the properties much more. Because, of course, the properties of the, me of the, the me mechanics of the fibers um, largely depend on the conditions of the um, starting solution, um, meaning the protein, the protein concentration, but also on additives, um, stabilizing additives, and so on. And this is sort of the setup that we use for scaling up now uh, the production process. There's, of course, other ways to spin fibers. Um, these are just some cartoons. Sorry, some stuff is here in German. Um, we, 
we also use wet spinning. Wet spinning is technically a little bit different to what we do with the biomimetic spinning because in wet spinning, what you use is a silk solution that you actually extrude. You not pull it, but you extrude it into a coagulation bath. That could be a salt, ionic solution. It could be an alcohol whatsoever. Um, then you can have some post-treatment, for instance, with steam. Thing, um, to um, post-treat um, the fibers, and then you can reel it, um, you can ride the reeling speed and so on. And this is also something that we have accomplished in the lab. And of course, you can um, also put in here um, a module for wet spinning. So we can have like one root biomimetic spinning and using the same solution in the wet spinning. And also we can uh, do dry spinning meaning that we have a, a solution that is extruded directly onto um, a vault or a roll. Um, and all we need in here between is just um, a drying, a drying um, apparatus, like by infrared light, high temperature, to remove the liquids. Um, what we need here, of course, is a highly viscous solution, because if the uh, viscosity is too low, then we will not be able to make fibers. So that's the major difference between the dry spinning and the wet spinning. In wet spinning, we can have lower viscosities because here the chop is ma mainly done by the, by the coagulation bath. But here in dry spinning, we need a really highly viscous solution to get fibers out of that. But again, this can be incorporated in, in that machine, in the setup. And as I told you, there's space for gimmicks, so we can have like, you know, vapor steam machines in here between for post-treatments. We can have uh, infrared um, treatments in here. So we can um, deal with the protein fibers individually coming from each um, spinning device. Good. Um, this is um, what we use for making fibers which look alike or mimic the native uh, fibers. But we also have, yeah. Um, good point. So um, these fibers that we gain here, they have some features of the natural fiber, but what you see here is made of a single protein. Um, as I told you, spider silk, pro uh, well, one silk fiber, the flagelli form of, um, fiber, is made of a single protein, but most of the silk fibers is made of at least two or more proteins. So this is why we also use the robot to mix different solutions because we don't know um, what kind of solutions and mixtures we need right now to get the best performing fibers. Actually, a spider can change the composition all over time. So the spider changes the composition in dependence on humidity, temperature, daytime, feeding, so nutrients, and so on. And this is something we try to mimic with our apparatus, that we've really mixed different proteins. Um, so far, we haven't found anything that is identical to, to the natural fiber. Of course, we don't have the identical ingredients, but we have mechanics that are identical. We have, well, we have on one hand mechanics that are identical, or we can make similar structures, but we don't really have a single piece that really you can't um, distinguish from a natural spider. And also natural spiders have a skin and lipids and other stuff on top. So, but yes, in, in terms of mechanics, we can mimic um, the natural fibers and in terms of structure also. And this comes along, of course. I mean, if you have a similar structure, you get similar mechanics. And you have a similar alignment of the structure. That's also important. Okay. Um, since we started a little bit later, should I continue for like 10 more minutes or should we make break now or I don't care. Um, okay, so, so let's continue a little bit with, with, with fibers um, and then I may take a break like after a few more slides. So um, this is what we do making fibers that look alike um, the natural fibers, meaning diameters of several microns. We are also able to make much thinner fibers, which you don't find in nature, but um, which might have also um, some use in, in application. 
And these are nanofibers that are typically produced as so-called non-wovens. Non-wovens are fibers that are formed um, in, in one process without any weaving or knitting and so on. So actually what you do is you make a fiber and you deposit it somewhere randomly and this is what you call then a non-woven. So it's a mesh of fibers um, where you can of course control the diameter of the fibers but also the diameter of the, or the pores of the spacings. What could you use such non-wovens for? Um, well, it could be for filter systems and the same thing can be used for wound coverage. And um, so f about the wound coverage, I will talk more about on Friday. But um, first, I would like to introduce the technique a bit that we use. I mean, there's several ways to make non-wovens um, with technical means. We are using the technique of electrospinning that you also have in, in, in your lab. So it, the principle is quite easy. So you have a solution with a certain uh, viscosity. It should be um, not um, too, well, too, too, well, it should have enough viscosity that it's not just dripping out of the syringe. Um, so you need some um, um, rheological behavior of the stuff that allows you to push, push it through a capillary tip, um, but it should not be too, uh, um, too, too uh, liquid. And what you do then, you um, extrude that um, solution into um, an uh, electric field with very high voltage. So we talk about like 30,000 volts or something. Um, and due to the um, electrostatic um, loading of this um, solution here at the, uh, at the very tip of this capillary, um, there forms a so-called Taylor cone. And this Taylor cone actually um, induces now under the correct conditions meaning the correct protein concentration, the best distance between the two electrodes, because you have a counter electrode down here, um, and some shielding and so on. It forms a jet, and out of this jet you can make a fiber. Um, and what you need, of course, is then a collector blade, and the collector blade would be the counter electrode, while you use the capillary tip as the electrode, um, and this induces this electric field, and this is how you you can make this fibrous mesh. And if you just put it like, like shown here on this collector plate, um, you get this um, non-wovens down there. So this is one of the setups that we have in the lab. Um, you see it's a quite complicated setup because it's a fully dynamic electrospinning device. So um, in this case, we have here the capillary tip up there. Um, it's controlled by a robot, so we can go in X and Y. Um, um, directions and we also have down here different um, collecting devices like a plate or a roller drum depending on what we want to do. You see here this plate, it's one by one meter so we can really spin large non-woven meshes and this is also movable in the set direction. So this allows us to dynamically during the spinning process um, move the tip in every direction X, Y and Z. Um, yeah, there's some more gimmicks, just, you know, photographs and so on. Um, so what we can do in here is making mesh, but we also can make single fibers, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later by using this roller drum. But this is more or less the setup, and it's easy to, to control. So there's just a computer hooked up, and this steers everything, like the robot moving the capillary tip and the table, um, and so on. And we can control, of course, the... Um, electric field and, and, and everything uh, within there. So there's also a camera um, adjusted there s directly looking at the ca uh, Taylor cone. So we have a uh, camera focusing here on the chat so that we know what's going on there if everything's running properly or not. <coughs> so what can we do um, with, these, um, with this setup? Well, we can produce nanofibers. And the interesting thing is that we can actually cover quite a, a large range of fiber diameters. So um, this is 1.6 microns at very high protein concentrations. So we're talking here about 20% weight per volume. So there we get thick fibers, almost um, with diameters that we find in the other devices in wet spinning and in biomimetic spinning. But we can go uh, with lower protein concentrations to much thinner fibers. And the thinnest that we made so far has, hundred, uh, has, has um, 16 nanometers um, in, 
in diameter. So this is really um, a very, very thin, um, a very, very thin fiber, uh, not 16, um, 160. 160 nanometer in diameter. So a very thin fiber, um, and the thickness of the fiber just depends on the protein concentration that we're working with if we have the um, adjustment correct. So we can actually now adjust here the fiber thickness, and we can work with these very thin fibers, for instance, to um, apply them on uh, existing filter systems. And this is something that we accomplished last year together with um, a company that makes vacuum cleaners. They wanted to have better um, performing filters. Um, so what we did is, so this is such a filter. We just introduced such a non-woven mesh. Here you see such a non-woven mesh. And here you see an um, electromicrograph of it um, onto an existing filter system. And what you see happens is that actually there are pores in the filters. And by just electrospinning silk on top, you just fill up the pores. And this will, of course, increase um, the hold back of such a filter system. Because now particles have problems getting through these pores, although the air still flows nicely and freely through that system. And, and this is the major improvement. Because typically, I mean, if you want to have better filters, you make the pores smaller, but then you need higher pressure, more air, more energy to filter that stuff. So you can imagine that. I mean, if you just cut down the pore to that size, I mean, you need much more airflow. Um, and this means that you need much more energy. And now the idea is having a filter um, or a machine with the same type of energy or even with less energy um, than the machines on market, but having the same or even a better filter performance. Um, and this is accomplished by making these silk, uh, silk non-wovens on top of these um, existing filter systems. So, so how is such a um, uh, filter built? I mean, it's always um, a layer-by-layer layer technology. So you have several layers of, of these non-wovens. And our silk um, uh, non-woven is just one out of like five layers. And that's enough. So not the entire filter is made of silk, but just a single layer in between. And this is improving the um, filter performance. Um, as I told you, we also can make um, single fibers. Um, and here's the setup for that. So we have here um, a roller drum. It rotates with 4,000 rounds per minute, so quite fast. Um, and with this, we can also make single fibers um, by using electrospinning. You see here some shielding that we need also um, so that we don't get this non-woven mesh, but that we really get single fibers. And you see them here, this silver shining stuff here. This, these are the, the silk fibers. So we really can now make um, single fibers with 160 nanometers in diameter. Um, well. This here has been done with um, hexafluor isopropanol. Um, this has been done out of water. So um, we can play around with, with the conditions. And um, again, it's very important um, to make a long story short. It's very important what type of molecule you're using and what type of solvent. If we work with silk proteins that have no terminal regions, it doesn't matter if you work with organic solvents or with water. They behave quite similar. And sometimes it's then easier to work with an organic solvent because you can remove it faster than water. If we work with proteins that contain the terminal domains, and we do that when we want to have specific mechanical properties, then we have to work in water because they will lose their structure in an organic solvent and then all the effect is gone. So as long as we work with like full length proteins, we have to work in water. If we just work with like chops of it, we can do it in, in solvent. But it depends on the application. Here we don't need that much of mechanical strength because the mechanical strength here is provided by the, by the other layers. So therefore we can work here without the terminal domains, work with organic solvents, simple processes. As soon as we go to um, like wound coverage devices and so on, then we do not want to work with organic solvents. Then, then we want to work with water, and then um, we have to have different treatments. 
But again, we can use, I showed you the pipetting robot to begin with. We can use the pipetting robot, you know, to play around quite a lot with the conditions, um, even without. So we do that like biologists do it with in screenings. Yeah, so we, we let the robot do a thousand different things. I mean, if you would do that by hand, it will take forever. But, you know, you start the robot like Friday evening and you come in into the lab on Monday morning and it's done. And then you just analyze it. Or it automatically pipettes it to like um, a spectrometer and, you know, you get then even the analysis um, done by, by Monday. So that's very convenient. Um, so the, the interesting thing here now is that um, by making these nanofibrils um, as single fibers and not as a mesh, we can also make threads out of that. And this is shown here. So we actually can collect nanofibrils. Um, and of course, we can make them very long. And um, this is how they look like. So these are bundles of nanofibrils. And, and you see they're twisted around. Um, and they have quite um, interesting properties. Thickness here is roughly between 50 and 60 microns. But this just depends on how many of these uh, fibrils we take um, in this bundle. And here we tested um, some mechanics. And, and you're the experts in that. We do also a little bit of mechanics. Um, here are some untreated fibers. And what you see with the untreated fibers, we have a young modulus of roughly 215 uh, megapascal, tensile strength of 28 megapascal, and elongation to break of 21%. Um, so these are non-treated fibers, meaning these fibers, they come out of hexafluoisopropanol, and they're water-soluble. If you put them in water, they dissolve. Reason is that um, if you look at the structure, we still have some alpha helical structures in there, which is induced by the um, hexafluoisopropanol. It's inducing alpha helical structure. Um, and it's not completely um, removed by the spinning process. So what you have to do is to do some post-treatment. And you can do that with methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, with alcohol water mixtures. You can do that in a bath. We typically do that in a steam because this is less harsh. It's a, a slower process, but um, more reproducible. And it does not, what we call baking the fibers together. If we put it in a bath, then actually we have some dissolvent of the structure and then a rearrangement, and what you get is one big string. If we do it in steam, we still have that setup that you see here. So this is a, a, a post-treated fiber. Um, and you still see the. Um, entanglement of these single fibrils that we have in there. And what you can see is, of course, the um, Young modulus um, gets up quite a bit, 388. Um, tensor strength gets up, and of course, we lose a bit elongation to break. But still, I mean, these fibers have some OK mechanical properties. And, and this is what we're currently investigating. What can we do with these kind of, of fibers? Because they're fairly easy to, to be produced in this electrospinning setup. Oh, we just can estimate it. So it's in, in, in 50 microns, it's roughly 10,000. We don't count them. I mean, we just can, I, we can tell you exactly the diameter of the single fibers because this is constant over time. And we can measure the diameter of, of, of the, th uh, the thread. Um, and therefore, we can just by, you know, getting the cross sections, we can calculate how many might be in there. But this is just roughly. Oh, well, I mean, OK, my engineers will tell you we are very precise because uh, we know how many rounds the roll made. And therefore, we know how many layers we have there. So oh, of course, that's not true. Because as you can see, the, um, the fibers are not, or the fibrils are not focused very much. So you always have some loss to the side. But you can at least get um, some ballparks, plus minus 5% of how much protein you have. And of course, you just can weight this on, on a scale. Um, so um, there's several means where you can get um, at least an estimate how many fibers are in there. And um, of course, you can directly measure the thickness. That's, that's no problem. Of course, this is crucial for, for getting the mechanical data. Um, so everything I'm showing here is true stress. So it's not engineered stress. 
um, fibers made of hexafluoroisopropanol and they are water soluble, so we have to actually make them water stable and therefore we treat them with uh, methanol vapor, methanol vapor, isopropanol vapor. And this makes them stiffer, um, stronger, less elastic, um, but also water, um, water stable. And therefore we can now actually measure um, these fibers under water. Um, as you can see, these are the untreated ones, these are the methanol treated ones, and this is what happens when you put them in water. And now what you can see is that um, you lose all the stiffness and you get now a much higher elasticity. And this is now depending on the uh, possibility of water molecules to bind to the surface of the individual fibrils. As I've shown you, that fiber has probably a million of, of, of fibrils, and the water can now work as a plastifier in between. So it can make structural lines actually on top of each fibril, and therefore the fibrils can glide along each other. And this is the explanation why in water we have now this much higher um, elongation properties, and um, we do not see supercontraction in that case. So this is also different to what we see with native spider silk proteins. Because here we have quite stable nanofibrils and the water just intercalates in between the fibrils and the fibrils can uh, move along each other, but the water is not really uptaken into the fibrils. So that's a big difference to what we see in um, natural fibers and this might be also a big advantage because with fibers made by that technique, we do not have supercontraction. Big difference. And supercontraction, well, it can be good for some applications, but for some it's probably not good. And therefore, this is why we invented this, this kind of technique. Um, now, something completely different. I mean, um, you see here already um, a nice circle um, with different, um, proper, uh, different materials, and they're all made out of the same protein. So what we did is we used one engineered um, molecule of Araneus, um, and of course we studied how can we reach threats, and this is how we detected the particles, and this is how we detected the hydrogels, um, um, and then of course finally we ended up with the threats. And uh, in addition then we thought about getting technological spinning um, roots, and we ended up with the non-wovens. But actually what we found is that um, these proteins have much more um, uh, properties than we thought to begin with, and we can do everything that we can do with classical polymers. And one thing that you do with classical polymers is making polymer films, um, or you also can make forms and capsules. So films, if you actually think about this um, table, for instance, there's definitely a polymer film on top. Um, to you know, make it water resistant, scratch resistant, whatsoever. So you have actually coatings on almost everything. Here is polymer film on top. Um, you have like polymer coatings even here on this um, wood. So there's everywhere is polymer coatings and films, or there on the on the pictures. So we thought about um, how about making films um, of silk proteins, um, and this is. A very simple, simple process, and I'll show you later also then the technical process that we're using. And the simple process is you have a silk solution, you just pour it in some beaker, and then you evaporate the solvent. And um, what you have then is just the film. I mean, what, what you literally do, you just remove the water by water or organic solvent by evaporation. And of course, depending on the solvent, you will gain different kind of uh, secondary structures in this film, uh, but you can change, in this case, the secondary structure in the film afterwards by um, a post-treatment, again, with alcohol, like methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, um, or with um, salting out agencies like phosphate, sulfate, and so on. Depending on this processing, you can get water-soluble films, which are nice if you want to have something that um, removes after contact with water, could be an application, or you can make water insoluble films, so if you want to have a, a water resistant coating of any kind of um, material. So this film casting actually works on almost every surface, so we, we, we did that already on uh, Teflon, polystyrene, um, stainless steel, um, glass, 
silicon. Um, so we can coat polymers, ceramics, metals in, in all kinds of, of ways. Um, uh, providing now, well, a, a new surface property to that material. Um, here are some characteristics of the films. Spider silk film um, has a strength in the regime of polyethylene film, so that's very common uh, polymer film, um, so around 20, 25 megapascal. I have to say these measurements were done with films of a thickness of one micron. Of course here with this casting we can make much thinner films but also thicker films, but the properties here are depicted on one micron films. So 20 megapascal, so polypropylene films are a little bit stronger and much stronger are polyethylene terephthalate, PET, that's the ones where the drinking bottles are made of, etc. So they, they are much stronger. Um, so what we've been interested in in that context is not very much the strength, but um, in this case the breathability. So how do gases pass over such a film? Again, having on mind probably um, medical applications, if you think about a wound coverage device, it's necessary that oxygen probably goes through, that maybe water vapor goes through, but it should be water resistant. And this is what we tested here, also in comparison to the plastics. And what you can see is that PE and PP, they have a very high oxygen permeability. So this is always measured in uh, cubic centimeters per um, micrometer per um, square meter per day at 23 degrees. So this is, these are um, ISO forms or ISO norms that you have to use for these measurements and we, we did that. So the oxygen permeability is quite high um, for these two materials and it's very low for PET. So therefore PET is very well um, classified for, you know, having like uh, soft beverages because the oxygen does not remove and then, you know, you still can drink it after a week or a month or a year. Um, so if you now check the water vapor permeability, um, meaning um, the steam, water steam, then you see that none of these plastics have a very high um, permeability. And this is pretty clear. I mean, if you have a coat made of polyethylene, you, you will s sweat dramatically underneath it. I mean, the water steam will not get out. For some um, clothing, uh, clothing um, textiles, you have these um, breathable membranes involved, if you think um, about brand names like Gore-Tex. Um, what what Gore-Tex does is they have a Teflon membrane, which they introduce in between the, the sheets of textile, and they make pores into the, into the Teflon. So the Teflon is highly, highly hydrophobic, so therefore it removes liquid water. Um, and the liquid water cannot go to this very tiny little pores, but um, water vapor can go through these pores. In spider silk films, well, as you can see, we don't need that. So we don't need po have pores inside because the silk films already are permeable for water vapor in the same regime as for oxygen. And this is now very neat because you can actually use such a silk film and just, you know, put it on a wound and it's nicely, um, it's nicely breathable. Um, and you could also put that into a textile, for instance, and you have a very good uh, water vapor permeability. Importantly, and that's the difference to the Teflon membrane, the silk films, they're shiny, so they're brilliant. They have no light absorption. You can look through it. So if we put um, such a coating on any kind of material, you hardly can see there's a coating on it. You just see a more brilliant um, shine, um, and it's feeling much softer. So the haptics are very good. And this is what we uh, use for making cosmetics. So one of the first products probably coming on market this year will be a conditioner uh, with the silk because uh, this, this films also form on hair and the hair looks nice, especially for the ladies, and you can comb through it very easily. Um, and it feels very silky, right? Because there's silk protein in there. And it's funny because there's many products, shampoos, um, advertising with silk, but they do not have silk inside. Well, if you turn it around, it says on the back, hydrolyzed silk, meaning these are amino acids, <laughs> nothing else. There's no protein in there. And um, 
My company, we bought now um, the major patent from L'Oreal because they were covering and claiming everything that has uh, to do with spider silk and uh, silk proteins at all, but this uh, patent now belongs to the to, to, to company, so therefore we can also now put cosmetical products on market without you know, cross-licensing with, with big, big players. And it works very nicely. So um, the ladies in the company, they're very, very uh, happy about having that. Um, so this is one possibility, but you can also, you know, use that on skin, as I uh, told you, but also for textiles. Of course, if you now think about such a process, um, costing uh, is not very good. I mean, you don't want to have a beaker and put it on your head and then wait until, you know, everything evaporates. So that, that won't work. So you need different techniques. And one technique, and again, I'm sorry for, for the German language here, but I explain it to you. Uh, one technique, especially if we want to make coatings for textiles or for metals or for whatsoever, is spraying. So what we have here are um, standardized airbrush um, um, jets that we can actually um, control by computers. And then we just put it on whatever kind of material that we can continuously rotating down there or we can also, you know, um, harvest it here so we can have endlessly uh, material running through it. We have here some post-treatments um, for drying and removing the solvent. In this case, we do that with uh, infrared um, treatment. So we use temperature um, to remove everything. And the temperature also induces the conformational change in the protein. So making then the film uh, water stable. And then we just can remove the silk foil here at the end. Or we can leave it on if we want to make a, a coating. We just leave it on and, and, and gather the material back here. So this is the machine that we built. It roughly has the length of these tables here. Um, again, um, we have several control units. These are the heaters, um, pressure control for the air brush um, stuff. And, and um, so the air brush um, jets would be up there, up front. Here you see some, some setups where the air brush, here are the chats are located, and you can actually adjust them by computer in the angle, so you can even like, spray like this. Um, and then, um, again, we can uh, have here some f further gimmicks, like post-processing post treatments down there, um, and then uh, the film can run here. So here is the drying compartment, um, and here you see some of the gimmicks, so you can, you know, um, spray on the, f the silk proteins here and they run along and they are dried and then you can actually go down here and then put it on some other kind of a roll or you can um, post treat it here and it, or it can come back and you can have a second coating and so on. You can make layer by layer technologies so having one silk protein and then another silk protein you can incorporate drugs for instance and can make sandwiches of coating so everything's possible with that machine which was built by three of my students, so, so um, in the third year or something. So this is really uh, what we call team projects. They take roughly three months, uh, six months, um, and um, they, they constructed that machine. And it's running well, so we started the machine bef slightly before Christmas. So um, what are the parameters of these silk films? And, and this is quite intriguing because we did some thermal, n not only mechanical um, uh, analysis, but also thermal analysis. And we found out that these silk films are quite stable against heat treatment. And here you see, again, this depends on the solvent from which we make the films off. So AQ stands for um, aqueous solution, um, as cast or methanol treated. Or we have F FA, this is formic acid. Or HFIP, this is hexafluoroisopropanol with or without methanol post-treatment to, to stabilize the structures. And you see here, it's only um, the um, HFIP non-treated that has less uh, thermal stability, but all the others are quite stable, even the S-cast uh, films. And the uh, same can be seen here in the differential scanning calorimetry that we have um, um, glass um, temperature points which are above um, 300 degrees centigrade. And this is much um, more stable than um, um, any other polymer. And this is very uh, surprising that the protein film has a higher thermal stability than a polymer film. And this now opens um, up quite a lot of uh, possible applications because we can even make now coatings that are more stable than plastic coatings. And, and, and now we have actually something 
where we can um, compete with, with polymers even if the silk films are much more um, expensive because we have a higher thermal stability. And this is of course then um, of interest for um, applications in the automotive industry, in cars and so on, because there um, typically the polymers have to withstand huge temperature variations. Um, so they are quite stable. Um, and the other thing is we can nicely control the surface roughness. As you know from silk, it, it uh, has a very nice touch. It has very good haptics. And this is coming from the, the, a very flat surface. And we can make the same thing with the film. So we can make surfaces that are quite flat. And here you see an um, atomic force um, scanning of such a surface. And, and you see here the surface roughness is around one nanometer can't even feel that with your fingers. And then we can slightly increase that and here we have like five nanometers and we can even go up to the micron scale. So just by depending on how we post treat, how we spray or cast the material and how we post treat the, uh, the films, we can nicely control um, the surface properties of the films. And this is then something that we also observe on hair. So if we, if we just put it in a shampoo, um, the hair is getting these very smooth and very flat surface and therefore you can comb through the, the hair much more easily and, um, and it's also then getting this shiny um, appearance to the hair. So this, this works very nicely. So um, final um, application or final processing technique I want to show to you today and I will um, more intensely talk about the capsules tomorrow is the formation of capsules. What are capsules? Well, capsules are well, literally films surrounding a droplet. Um, and this is actually what, what we do here. So um, we make use of a very simple property of silk proteins that is called amphiphilicity. What is amphiphilicity? Well, typically um, a protein is well, hydrophilic or it's hydrophobic or has both properties. A protein that, that has equally hydrophilic and equally hydrophobic properties is called amphiphilic. And this actually is based, these amphiphilic properties are based on these two um, structural parts that are repeating, these polyalanine sequences and then these glycine proline rich sequences. Polyalanine is hydrophobic, glycine proline is hydrophilic. And this is because it's a repeated structure ongoing uh, throughout the whole molecule. What does this mean? Well, if you now have two liquids, a polar and a nonpolar one, water and oil, for instance, the molecules that come to that interface will orient the different side chains towards the different um, solvents. So the polar ones will go to the polar solvent. So the hydrophilic side chains, glycine proline, will go to water. And the hydrophobic ones will go to the oil phase. So polyalanine will stick outwards. So, and this is exactly what happens. So if you have the silk proteins, these are the orange dots here, are solved in water and you can have additional proteins or drugs or whatsoever in the water. And you make now an emulsion in an oil, like in toluene. What happens is that the molecules, just by diffusion, reach that interface between water and oil. And what will happen is because they like it there. I mean, typically, a, a molecule that comes there just, you know, retracts again because it doesn't like the oil phase very much. But the amphiphilic molecules, they like it. They stay there and they expose all the hydrophobic residues to the oil phase. And they expose all the um, hydrophilic parts to the, to the water phase. And therefore, the silk proteins over time accumulate at the interface. And this is what happens. So you have like a random coil structure in solution and you have the absorption to this interface. And what happens is you align now sort of, you know, your, your amino acids. The polyalanines, they go to the oil phase and they form then the beta sheets. And uh, the glycine proline rich um, um, areas, they concentrate it inside. So what you're actually creating is now a structure which surrounds that droplet. And literally this forms nothing else than a film. So you make just a silk film surrounding the water droplet with all the batter sheets sticking outwards and everything else sticking inwards. And actually, if you have um, chosen your protein concentration right, 
um, then you have enough molecules here to get a stable film. And this is so stable that you can transfer it back into water. Um, and, and then you have actually inside the aqueous solution from the beginning with your drug or whatsoever. And outside, again, you have water. So you have a water in water, a capsule that has water in water. <coughs> um, and, and here you see such a capsule. The dimensions are, well, depending on the dimensions of the droplet to begin with. So here we have 10 microns, so the droplets had 10, 10 microns. Um, if you make smaller droplets, you get smaller capsules. Um, and tomorrow I will show you then the thickness here, because this is a very thin, um, a thin membrane surrounding that droplet in the ballpark of 50 to 70 nanometers. And also we'll talk a little bit about the mechanical properties of that, because these capsules, they behave like glass. So they're quite stiff, so they have um, an elastic modulus around 3 to 4 gigapascal, so it's like a glassy, tiny little bead. And I will show you much more of the properties of these capsules tomorrow. But literally, and therefore I was mentioning it today already, this is nothing else than making a film um, just surrounding, in this case, surrounding a droplet. So finally, um, last story um, for processing. I've shown you now several of these um, processing routes, how to make hydrogels, how to make frets, non-wovens, particles. We will talk more about particles tomorrow because these are, of course, very useful for drug delivery. We will talk more about capsules tomorrow. We talked about films. I haven't talked about forms, but, but you know, making forms is a little bit similar to making hydrogels, so therefore I left that out. Um, so this is pretty much what we can do on the part of technical processing. But what about more genetic processing, genetic engineering? What can we else do um, with silk proteins using a biotechnological approach? And this now really makes the whole thing very neat because now we can even go back and adopt new properties to the molecules to achieve the new functions in the materials. And this is one, one route that we did, and I will show you then for the tissue engineering much more routes um, that we can actually now incorporate properties that you will never find in the native silk proteins. And one possibility is to incorporate the amino acid cysteine. I told you that in these repeating units we don't have cysteines, so we can very precisely incorporate cysteines in the sequence on our will. Of course, you need to know a little bit about the structure and so on because you cannot place the cysteine everywhere. So you have to very precisely choose the position. And of course, you have then to double check that the introduction of a single cysteine does not disturb the entire structure, assembly, and function. But in principle, you can do that. So just incorporate the cysteine inside a silk molecule, one route. Or alternatively, you just can add what we call a tag. So some additional amino acids that contain then such a functional um, amino acid like cysteine um, and add this tag to your molecule and add the function therefore. So why is cysteine such an interesting amino acid? Well, cysteine is the only um, amino acid that contains a thiol group and thiol groups are chemically very specific. So we can make a very specific chemistry with thiol groups uh, without, you know, having chemical interactions with any other amino acid side chain. So therefore, we can use now the cysteine locations very precisely to add molecules, add functions, and so on. If we start with this engineered silk protein, and you've seen that before, so it's based on ADF4. It has 16 repeats of that motif C. You see the motif C here not contain a cysteine. So that's the basic engineered um, silk protein. And now we engineered, well, further molecules by introducing the cysteines. Two roots. Well, either we uh, make um, a modified C motif where we replace one of the amino acids by cysteine. And then what we can make is, well, we could make 16 repeats with, with a thiol, but this is what we don't want to have. We want to have single functional groups. So one functional group per one protein. 
because then we have the best control over the process. Again, I've told this several times today, for us it's very important to have control over the process, all the processes. And the best control is to have a single functional group for a single protein because then I know if my reaction worked or not and then I really can correlate a function or a functional group to a function. So we can put the cysteine into the C motif and then we can just put the, the, this additional C motif at the end or at the beginning. We could actually put it anywhere in here between. So we can actually also choose the location where the, the thiol group is. So that's quite simple, that's one possibility. Or we use the tags, and the tags typically can just be added on either end, the amino terminus or the carboxy terminus. In this case, the amino terminus. So what we now create are um, proteins that contain a single thiol group, and we can actually now use this thiol group for functionalization. But this is not the only thing. I mean, we can, of course, also introduce other sequences. And I will show you when we talk about tissue engineering that we can use cell-specific sequences, like um, RGD sequences, which are known to interact with integrins. And I will talk much more about that on Friday. So we can actually introduce here any kind of sequence. We can also make hybrid proteins with other stuff. And this has been shown nicely by David Kaplan and other people in the world that you can actually make a hybrid of a silk molecule with elastin or, you know, with any kind of structural protein. So this works very nicely um, in order to combine features of the individual um, proteins. And this is what you then can do with it. And, and this is just shown now for the cysteine mutants. But, you know, as I told you, you can do that for any, any kind of, of uh, modification. So we can <coughs> modify or we can process now these modified molecules in the same way as we do with the, with the basic um, proteins. We can make particles or capsules. We can make films. We can make fibers. <coughs> and it's important now that we have located the system. Therefore, it's also important to have a single functional group per protein. Now it's important by processing to um, provide a position where um, the functional group is surface exposed. This is the very important thing because it won't be of help if the, if the cysteine would be inside the structure somewhere. If it's not seen from outside, then, well, the, the functionality will be null. Um, so we need to have positions where we can actually have then the thiol group surface exposed in the particle or in the film or in the fiber. What we then can do is we can do chemical coupling. So we can, and, and this has been shown um, quite some time ago, we can, for instance, make films. Um, and this is just a basic protein. Um, and we just added some nanogold particles having a chemical linker specific for the thiol group. And you see no reaction with the basic silk. This is FITZI, a fluorescent marker with a chemical group to a Tech to, uh, the thiol of the cysteine, and you see no reaction with the basic molecules. Of course, there's no thiol in there. And this is a large enzyme. It's beta-galactosidase. It's a huge enzyme. Um, and you see no interaction with the surface. Um, however, if we now have the activated or the modified proteins that have the cysteine with the thiol group, what you can see is the nanogold nicely um, can be linked to the surface. And you see it here in a um, TAM image. Same is true for, for the FITSI. And it's important to, to mention that both of these are chemically linked. They're cross-linked. You cannot remove that by washing. You cannot even remove that with denaturants. I mean, it's a chemical bond. It's fixed. Um, you have to destroy the structure in order to remove the functionality. So therefore, you can use that, for instance, to, to um, covalently dye um, a textile and you kind of wash it out. I mean, one of the problems, right? If you have a red pullover and it's made of silk and you put it in the washing machine and you wash it too hot, um, the red color is gone and then the pullover is probably that size. Um, and here, at least, I mean, you could put the dye covalently on the silk and it will stay on even if the pullover is like that size. It's still red. Um, so, so th these are very nice um, um, things. With, with the gold, you can make, um, um, if, if you have a closer density of the gold particles, you even can make a layer of gold. And this is then a conductive surface. And, and we also um, shown that. So the silk itself, the silk film is an isolator. So you have an isolating film and you have a, a, a 
um, conductive film on top, and you can do a lot of things with that. You can make rolls and tubes out of that, but you also can use just the polarity of these two things to have like conductance and, and isolation. And with the enzymes, that's especially remarkable because that enzyme is a tetrameric enzyme, meaning this is only active once four molecules are together. So that's the quaternary structure. It's a tetramer. However, since we only have a single cysteine, only one of these enzymes is linked to the silk film. And what this indicates is that um, the surface area of the silk film here um, not only allows the linkage of the single beta-galactosidase, it also stabilizes the active tetrameric enzyme here. And you see that it's tetrameric because here we use the color assay to show the activity of the enzyme. So it actually maintains the activity of the beta-galactosidase, although just um, one-fourth of the molecules is covalently linked. Well, this means that, of course, the enzyme you can remove by washing or with, with, with um, denaturants, but still, um, this provides now a nice surface for stabilizing enzymatic reactions. And here you can think about biosensoring whatsoever. So you can actually add here antibodies, as you can see here. This should be an antibody. So you can actually um, add on antibodies for you know, detecting different kinds of things. But these are different um, types of applications. No biomedical ones, well, at least most of them. So therefore, I'm not talking about that, but we're pretty much interested also in these technical applications. Conductivity is a big issue. Dyeing is especially important for, for textile properties. And enzymatic activity is important for different types of things, like you know, creating new washing powders and so on. Um, so with this, I'd like to end.